Welcome to Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Brittany Zimmerman. And I'm Richard Ha, your co-host. And joining us today is our guest, Dr. Michael Ginsberg, who will be helping us do a deep dive into our e-invention. Welcome, Dr. Ginsberg. Thanks, Brittany. Awesome. So our e-letter invention this week, ladies and gentlemen, is electrolyzers. Yeah. All right, Richard, what do you know about electrolyzers? Electrolyzers. Something bubbles up out of the water and something happens. Um, I got to <laughs> give more explanation. <laughs> awesome. Maybe Michael can help us dive a little bit deeper at a high level. Michael, give us an introduction uh, to who you are and then maybe transition into what an electrolyzer is. On. So a pleasure to be with you all. At a very high level, um, Richard had it right. Basically, we're taking water, H2O, and we're splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen using an electrical current. So uh, it's allowing us to harness the hydrogen fuel um, for a lot of applications. Awesome. And give us some of your background, Michael, where you come from, what is your experience with electrolyzers? Fill in the picture for us. Yeah, absolutely. So I've worked uh, for the last 15 years in renewable energy, primarily working on solar projects, um, modeling and, and, uh, and designing and uh, installing renewables. And for the last seven years, I've worked on a PhD in uh, electrolysis. Um, and figuring out how to commercialize electrolyzer systems. And so uh, I've, I've been able to now in my most recent role, uh, develop uh, green hydrogen projects throughout the United States. That is exciting. Yeah, we're here um, in Hawaii, I think, you know. You know. Um, and this state in particular has shown a lot of interest in the potential of moving to a hydrogen-based economy. And I know that's something uh, that Richard has been uh, having conversations around and spearheading as well. So I'm really excited to kind of pull the veil over, you know, out from underneath or around, you know, what electrolysis is. So we have these conversations here about hydrogen and how it could help us in the future, but where does it really come from, right? Like we hear about different colors and different types and I'm really interested in kind of having a conversation there, right? Are there better hydrogens than others? And then diving into how those are made. Yeah, absolutely. And we call that the hydrogen color wheel, which is becoming um, sort of a, a every, everybody's biggest frustration. So, the hydrogen color wheel is all about, you know, getting to zero carbon. And when we when we say it's green hydrogen, we mean that it's a hydrogen that has no carbon dioxide emissions. And so um, one other way to look at that is then just looking at the carbon intensity of the produced hydrogen. So most hydrogen today, 95% of it is made from burning natural gas. It's called steam methane reformation. And so obviously that emits a lot of CO2. So there are a lot of other ways of doing it. Um, the primary way that we look at with green hydrogen is electrolysis, because when you split water, there's no carbon uh, emissions. But there are other ways. You could do what's called methane pyrolysis. You end up with a solid carbon. Um, and, and so there's just a, a variety of ways. You could also car uh, capture the carbon from natural gas uh, burning. And so we call that uh, blue hydrogen. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're we're all, you know, moving towards um, just looking at hydrogen with the lens of what is the emissions profile. Um, and so, you know, those those are the major the major ways of looking at it. OK, so green hydrogen isn't the color green. It just means there's no CO2 released in its production. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just Could like we make it energy. green? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, then um, how we talked a little bit about electrolysis, right? We're kind of splitting things, um, uh, water, right? To make hydrogen and uh, oxygen. Are there different ways, are there different types of electrolyzer? Yeah, that's a great question. Absolutely. So there are several different types. Um, and 
So there's several mature types of electrolyzers. And in fact, for some uh, viewers, they probably are, are familiar with the fact that this electrolyzer technology has been around for, for a, lot, a number of years, since really the 1970s. Um, the earliest form was called the alkaline electrolyzer, and, it, and it's so-called because it was based in an alkaline electrolyte or a liquid that passed the charge. Um, we also have what's called a PEM or a polymer electrolyte membrane electrolyzer, and that's a solid uh, membrane that transports the, we call the ions across the, um, across the, the anode and the cathode or the two sides of the electrolyzer. Those are the two most mature types. There's several other types that are also maturing, but they're less developed at this stage. And what are the benefits and drawbacks to either taking the alkaline approach or the PEM approach? Yeah, so the alkaline, more mature, better cost profile in terms of the upfront cost, but there is a higher um, operations and maintenance long-term. Um, you need to manage a liquid electrolyte uh, you need to have a larger footprint to store that medium. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest benefits of the PEM system, which was the focus of my uh, dissertation research, is the ability of a PEM to respond rapidly to changes in the renewable energy supply. So if there's, a, for instance, solar power that's powering that electrolyzer, the PEM system could rapidly fluctuate based on the amount of power that's coming into it. On, on the other hand, an alkaline system is a little bit more sluggish. Um, it takes a longer time to respond. And so that's probably one of the biggest um, differences. The PEM system also um, is able to what we operate at what we call a higher current density. So when we are able to operate at a high current density, we can generate more hydrogen versus uh, a lower current density. So it can be more compact. Um, mm -hmm. We need a lot more cells or active area to generate elect, um, the hydrogen if we use an alkaline electrolyzer. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, um, so you're saying that you did your dissertation in PEM style technologies. Um, what did you do your dissertation on? Yeah, so uh, I so saw last six or seven years now, I focused on the commercialization of these PEM electrolyzers. And so, what I looked at specifically was how do we reduce the cost of making hydrogen by only using um, these PEM electrolyzers and by varying the rate of hydrogen production. So um, one question really key to this research was assuming that we could change the amount of hydrogen that's being produced during the day, how does varying the production reduce the cost if we mm -hmm. can take advantage of really low cost electricity because keep in mind that our major inputs here are water and power so if we can generate a tremendous amount of hydrogen when the cost of electricity is really low we should we expect that we should have a very low cost of hydrogen production vice versa uh, when the cost of electricity is very high we should ramp it down and so we're sort of in this web 1.0 version of electro electrolyzers where they're just running 24 seven. So I tried to look at this more closely to get a more nuanced uh, view of this. And what I found was that we could actually reduce the, the uh, cost of making hydrogen by up to 60 to 80% over just running them constantly. You, you know, uh, we're sitting out here in Hawaii, we're sitting out here in the middle of the Pacific and and so we need to be able to respond quickly to changing uh, uh, events. So right off the bat, the uh, PIM sounds like it reacts quicker. But uh, do you need to have uh, storage? Um, and how does that play into everything? Yeah. So if you, yeah, absolutely. If you were talking about the storage of the hydrogen itself, sometimes we do. Uh, recommend or we do include hydrogen storage if you need to make sure that you have a constant flow of hydrogen to wherever your application is. So for instance, if you're overproducing or underproducing, then we include what's called buffer storage. So we we smooth the flow of um, of the hydrogen to the end end user. So yes, absolutely. We also uh, use another form of storage sometimes battery 
battery storage if we're using a solar or wind farm. What you what you find is that um, obviously because the solar and wind isn't always producing energy, um, your electrolyzer won't always be running. So we we often increase what's called our um, capacity factor by increase by adding some battery storage. We're able to run that electrolyzer more cons uh, consistently. Yeah, you know, you know what I've noticed in Hawaii is that it appears that when we do battery storage, we have about four hours worth of storage batteries, and uh, that that seems like a small amount of storage in case something bad happens. Uh, how, how's how's that sound to you? Four hours worth of storage batteries. Yeah, that's just that really four hour discharge or duration of storage is pretty standard in terms of the uh, battery storage that's available today. Mm -hmm. You have a, either a two or a four hour battery. So it is it is a challenge in terms of not only the duration, but also the cost. We can run the we can discharge the battery at a lower capacity or output uh, over over a longer duration of time. So that's also possible. So if we have a large battery, we can discharge it more slowly. Um, but yeah, battery storage is is also one of the reasons why the challenges with battery storage are one of the reasons why electrolyzers have a role or hydrogen has a role because it can store energy for longer durations of time versus a battery. Yeah. Here in Hawaii, we have one of the highest costs of energy in the world. So it's a really interesting place when we're looking um, and considering hydrogen as a possibility, right? As you were saying, Michael, the two inputs are water and electricity, right? For electrolysis. We do have um, a lot of access, of course, to some of the renewable uh, options. Um, we also happen to be sitting here, right? In a place where uh, there's a geothermal plant as well. So you um, have spoken about some of the pros of utilizing electrolysis with, um, you know, potentially wind and solar applications. Has there been any research uh, done into electrolysis paired with geothermal? Yeah, absolutely there has. And I would say that geothermal could provide a more consistent uh, uh, um, a consistent output of, of energy as compared to solar and wind. It's mm -hmm. a matter of getting getting access to it, and there's a larger capital investment. Uh, I'm sure Richard could could speak to 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 harness the required amount of um, of geothermal energy that would be needed. But certainly, that's something that has been looked into. Yeah, I I, I don't want to go too too far off topic, but uh, you know, if you're gonna do a battery storage. Uh, what is the long-term effect on the climate? Because you you have to have um, rare earth metals, minerals, and stuff like that, which is not, uh, and we don't have an endless supply of that either, yeah? Yeah, for sure. So and that's a great point. And so not only batteries, but also electrolyzers, uh, some of them, especially the PEM, use rare earth metals. So that that is uh that is an important issue that we need to address and i would say that there's a lot of work being done today in terms of recycling of those rare earth metals there's some companies now in um for instance in the in the salton uh sea that are uh working to uh recover and recycle and also harvest um rare earths but i i would say that um if you look at the full life cycle uh analysis we're still we're still seeing a net improvement over a tremendously net improvement over the traditional fossil fuel based mm -hmm. um, energy if we if we transition over to battery storage and and renewable energy so i think one of the not to get into the weeds too much but one of the major research um priorities as we move forward in this is to reduce our reliance on um critical rare earth metals like lithium and um you know platinum and iridium um and so i've seen a lot of work and success actually in replacement of those critical um, metals, or P a platinum group metals with non-PGM alternatives. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. Okay. So I know that, uh, Michael, you had shared with us beforehand this really cool, like, uh, I don't know if people say GIF or GIF, <laughs> but it kind of shows how things are moving um, in yeah. an electrolysis unit. Yeah. So I can kind of walk through that and then folks can take a look um, online at their leisure. So essentially, if you can visualize this, what we're seeing is you have water flowing in. Um, and then you also have electrons or electricity uh, coming in. And so those two meet um, in at the membrane. And so you have the you have H2O, right? And then you have oxygen uh, splitting off into the anode. Um, and then you have these hydrogen protons or H2, um, sol we call them solvated protons that are then moving over to the cathode. Um, and so you have that essentially water, electricity, and then the split uh, occurs and the anode is oxygen, um, cathode is hydrogen. And never to sell the two meat, <laughs> that's the idea. Uh, you shouldn't have any crossover, that's, uh, that's obviously an issue. But yeah, that's the, the that's the general principle. It's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, you require a certain minimum amount of voltage or electricity, and um, a certain amount of water to make you know certain amount of hydrogen. And what what happens with the oxygen at the back end of the system? Yeah, that's a great question. So oxygen can you know is valuable in and of itself. It can be. Uh, certainly um, commoditized, and mm -hmm. there's a number of companies that certainly would be willing to pay for that oxygen. The stoichiometry, if you look at just how much oxygen on a mass basis is is generated, is about eight times, um, and so the molar mass. So so there's a lot of oxygen that's generated, and it can be it can be used. Yeah, it, it, if it's not used, then it's vented. Or um, I've seen some projects taking that oxygen. Um, and in fact, there's a benefit of injecting, um, as you know, Brittany, injecting oxygen into waste streams to um, improve aerobic digestion, which is a form of waste wa wastewater treatment. Ooh, exciting. Okay, so if I'm uh, the average person sitting in Hawaii and I hear about these systems, it's like, okay, so water comes into the system, electricity comes into the system, and then I get hydrogen and I get oxygen separated, right? Okay. Um, I think I have a pretty decent understanding as the general person about what oxygen is good for, right? I know that I breathe it and I know that it's good for the environment. What uh, do I utilize the hydrogen for then, you know, in, in my everyday life? Where, where do I see hydrogen playing a role, you know, in my day-to-day -day in the future if we did move to a hydrogen economy? For sure. And I think that the nearest term application of hydrogen for, um, for, 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 you know, general folks, everyday folks looking in their communities is most likely going to be in transportation and mobility. So mm -hmm. we are starting to see um, the fuel cell vehicle industry taking off. And so our first, one of my first plants that we're working on is actually for mobility. So essentially it's the gas station for a hydrogen powered vehicle. Um, primarily, we're seeing them for heavy-duty vehicles, mm -hmm. uh, and so they they have a certain benefit over a, a traditional battery electric vehicles for these these heavy-duty um, these heavy-duty cars. And so that's probably number one. Um, number two, you're you're going to see the primary you know uses of hydrogen are really out of sight for for most people. So it's for you know industrial processes like steel. Uh, cement and um, uh, potentially aviation fuel. So the, the, these are these are more industrial processes that you know people are not really going to see. But we we call these hard to reach sectors because they are really out of view uh, of 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 most of most everyday uh, people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be remiss to to not mention that. Uh, ammonia or fertilizer is also requiring hydrogen as a major input. So nitrogen, hydrogen, with that traditional Haber-Bosch process, you make you make ammonia. So when we call something green ammonia, we're just re uh, uh, replacing the 
a hydrogen with the electrolytic hydrogen. Um, and so we make ammonia that way. So I see that as a big market in the near term as well. You know, lately I've been noticing um, internal combustion engines running off of hydrogen. Um, what, what does that look like to you? Yeah, so personally, okay, so personally I prefer the fuel cell electric vehicle. Um, when you combust hydrogen, you you end up with some volatiles or some uh, undesirable byproducts. You could have, you know, socks and NOx. Um, but, you know, it's certainly you're not going to end up with CO2 emissions. Um, uh, I think that, you know, certainly there's a lot of interest in, in the internal combustion uh, uh, for hydrogen, but I would say that fuel cell, fuel cell EV, uh, fuel cell electric vehicle is probably going to be the, the primary uh, form of transportation with hydrogen in the future. Oh, how far off are we? Yeah, so not far. I mean, um, I work, I mean, I'm in this every day, but I would say that the, the market is there. It's just, it's just emerging. Um, you could, I could mention like Nikola, for instance, is now, um, you know, producing uh, a large number of these, of these vehicles. So, yeah, I think that we're, we're there. We're at the very beginning. I think maybe within three to five years, we're going to see, you know, these vehicles hit the mass market um, and become much more widely available. What, where, where do you think uh, Hawaii can be relative to, because everything is about cost, yeah? You, you got to compare, no matter what you do, it, you know, it's just like farming. If the farmer makes money, the farmer is going to farm. So when you compare all the different possibilities, um, what, what uh, and my question is, what, what is going to be the effect on the regular folks, the rubber slipper folks, uh, for us being here in Hawaii? You know, we've got an advantage because, I mean, uh, uh, Brittany folks are doing, yeah. you know, what they're doing, and that, that's a big deal. Um, and, and of course, we have geothermal as well. Um, for me, I, I'm thinking that we have a big advantage over most of the world, actually. Is, is that a fair mm -hmm. assessment? Yeah, I agree. I think, I think the resources are really well uh, aligned in, in Hawaii. I think the, you know, the, the, the fact is um, hydrogen is really another form of uh, energy security. And it's also a commodity that can be exported. Um, and especially if we can take advantage of um, seawater or, or, you know, treat, treat that, treat the wastewater or seawater streams, there's certainly a, a lot of uh, potential uh, for, for, the, for, the, uh, for, for, for Hawaii to, to produce hydrogen. Now, it's certainly a challenge uh, when you look at the cost of electricity. So what I what I think is if you if you're if, if you're able to take advantage of abundant you know solar for instance and have a truly you know um, renewable uh, hydrogen facility that's probably going to be uh, more uh, preferable to 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 building out a lot of grid infrastructure or electrical infrastructure to supply the energy because it is very energy consu uh, consuming. So yeah, Brittany and um, and the team they they certainly have a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, great innovative ideas for how to lessen the burden on the uh, on the grid. Awesome. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. I know we're starting to wind down in time here. We only have a few more minutes. So one of the things um, I know a lot of people um, are concerned about in the hydrogen space and certainly in the electrolysis space is, is this safe? You know, if, if we were to see electrolyzers um, in our community is, you know, is this something I need to be worried about? Um, can I go close to it? You know, what, uh, what are the safety concerns around it? Yeah, for sure. So definitely something that I talk about a lot. I see those concerns. Um, certainly there's a history here. So uh, the, and I'm not gonna say there are none at all. I'm just gonna say that we, um, we have a, a long history now of developing codes and standards to protect or mitigate against uh, you know, catastrophes. Um, there, there are a lot of, if you look at the generation of hydrogen, there are a lot of alarms and sensors that are placed on that equipment. Um, you have 
uh, a lot of design measures that are put in place. For instance, minimum safety distances between piping and roads or people. Um, and so we, we've studied, or not we, but, you know, uh, uh, certain certain uh, uh, experts have studied the the uh, impact of blasts and how far that can go, both propagation uh, wide and, and vertical. So mm -hmm. I think we know a lot a lot about hydrogen and how it could potentially be flammable and harmful. Um, and so uh, as long as we design according to those standards, I think that we're going to be okay. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. And and one of the things uh, I wanted to mention too is, right, I, I know in NASA, at least, we've had a long history of utilizing hydrogen, right, um, as a propellant and for a few other things. Um, so there is a, a, a long industrial history with hydrogen that has been very safe, right? And um, that's something to point to as well. Um, in terms of also our vehicles, right? In in terms of we have gas tanks, right, on our vehicles right now. Um, and we utilize in our industry tanks of oxygen, for example, right? Oxygen is actually is a more dangerous thing to tank <laughs> than hydrogen is, right? And so it's really interesting as we do this because there are aspects in which actually your gasoline vehicle, right, and your gas tank is more dangerous um, than hydrogen. Uh, is so it it really comes down to recognizing that there is danger with just about everything right um, even dropping your glass right um, on the ground has an inherent danger so there is something um, to you know, needs to be taken into consideration with all of these things and um, I think we do exactly have mm -hmm, with hydrogen yeah and I would I would just add you know our whole gas infrastructure has been designed for methane or natural gas as a as a molecule. And it's a little unfair to say, okay, can we just transition that over to hydrogen? It's just a different type of type of type of fuel. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, blending it with an existing pipelines or building out some dedicated hydrogen pipelines. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I think I think we just need to consider uh, uh, the nature of the fuel. You know, and I'd like to mention one, one thing. Um, Hawaii is is fifth in the nation large metropolis that have lost population. We're number fifth in the nation. So that's that's because of jobs and, and costs and stuff like that. Do, do you see that uh, the possibility of making steel, for example, or aluminum or exploiting hydrogen and stuff like that as, as helping with that? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely one of the uh, big, big benefits of, of this new green hydrogen economy is we we see there's a lot of uh, jobs that can be created as opposed to, you know, solar or wind farms, which, you know, are, are, are really not requiring as much um, on, you know, uh, sort of on the ground uh, in, you know, in employees. So for instance, you know, for a, a typical, a small scale green hydrogen plant, we could be looking at at least 20 to 50 employees um, on a 20 for 20 years. Very cool. Well, awesome. I know we've uh, wound down our time here. Uh, any closing uh, questions or remarks, Richard? Oh, well, this sounds really promising and very exciting. Seems like we are at a kind of a special point in human history, you know, to me. But what do I know? I'm just a banana farmer. Oh, you're not pulling that one over on us, Richard. We know better. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. And thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Did you have any uh, last minute uh, comments um, that you'd like to uh, close down with? Yeah, thank you all. Thank you both for inviting me. And I would just say, I think Hawaii is especially a great place for, for green hydrogen. Um, it's a, it could be a real boon to the, to the economy and also position um, Hawaii as a, a leader in the, the new energy economy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this is Inventing Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you, Michael, for joining us today. And thank you to you, our viewers, for watching. If you want to get our email advisories to see a complete listing of our shows, you can sign up for them at thinktechhawaii.com. We will be back in two weeks. So please tune in and we will do a deep dive into our F invention. Until then, I'm Brittany Zimmerman.
Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.